Hi. Hello, everyone. So as Tim just said, we are the co-chairs for the Gov 2.0 Expo, which will be held next May at the Convention Center. Um, our call, for the, well, the conference itself will be a, a standard conference, so it's going to be three days, multi-track sessions, so you'll be able to pick and choose your adventure as you navigate through the Gov 2.0 world. Uh, the call for proposals will open next month, so we'd love to hear from you, your projects, your ideas, and your stories. We really want to um, engender the sense of community uh, among people that are passionate about Government 2.0, and we, we sincerely want to get your feedback about what you liked about this event, what you thought was missing, what we could have more of, and we want to incorporate that into the bigger Gov2 Expo in May. But what we want to do in this session is highlight the great things that happened yesterday at the Gov2.0 Expo Showcase. And what we did a few months ago is we had a call for proposals for five-minute talks in five categories of Government 2.0. And we got over 200 submissions of talks um, from all levels of government, federal, state, and local, from all over the country, from private companies, and from individual citizens. And we even got some international submissions. And only one out of eight of those talks was selected to be a finalist, or proposals were selected to be a finalist. And of the 25 talks yesterday, people voted by text messaging, by popular choice, in each of these five categories. And we have winners, and those are the winners that we're going to highlight for you today. And perhaps the most um, interesting thing that came out of the Government 2.0 Expo Showcase was that none of these five finalists work inside the Beltway. None of them work for the federal government. And so I think that you're going to see in, in these five talks, Government 2.0 through their eyes. And so we'd like to thank the uh, Expo Showcase Committee that really helped choose which proposals made it to the showcase yesterday. And then it was a, you know, a great array from um, applications for phones to internal productivity improvements to citizen action and outreach. So today's People's Choice presentations include uh, California Budget Crisis, uh, text messaging in Africa, Utah public safety, Islam in virtual worlds, and transit system in the Bay Area. So the first presentation is Peter Coates. He'll be presenting on the city of Santa Cruz offers blueprint for solving the California budget crisis with social media. Peter. My name is Peter Code, and I live in Santa Cruz, California. It's a redwood forest stuck in between a marine sanctuary and Silicon Valley, and it's a bit like living on the forest moon of Endor, except with the world's best surfing. But it's not without its challenges, especially when you start talking about politics. Much of our political debate is an argument between outliers on either side of an issue. Well, the majority, the reasonable center, is left mute. This year in Santa Cruz, we were facing a situation far too large to hand over to a vocal minority. Over the last 30 years, thanks to Prop 13 and a state constitution papered over with more than 435 revisions, all California cities and towns are facing budget crises of unimaginable proportions. We were, in fact we are, functionally bankrupt. In 2009, Santa Cruz has seen its general fund revenues decline, its health care costs soar, and its deficit ballooned to 15% of its general fund. Over the last five years, our city manager has been forced to eliminate 111 positions in a city of 800. We've closed a community pool, both our museums, and this year we closed our teen center. The government needed to communicate directly with the public and reset expectations of what we could or couldn't do in this budget environment. We also wanted to see where public opinion was and whether or not our citizens had any new takes or, or new ideas on the situation. Now, when talking about public commentary in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, generous would be to say that you know we have a vibrant history of public participation. The closer to be the truth would be that the lunatics sometimes run the asylum. Um, we also have problems with our mainstream media. Our twice sold and now understaffed newspaper has been moved to a frontage road 15 miles outside of town. And its comment section is like the daily hate. Um, we have no locally owned television stations, and our NPR station just laid off a third of its staff. We needed new tools to face this crisis, so three community volunteers, Shane Perlman, Peter Chester, and Rob Knight, and myself decided to create a portal to get community feedback on the situation. We had a week, we had no budget, and Shane had a newborn. 
The goal of the project was to grasp at the, the, the middle, the reasonable middle. Instead of blindly throwing open the digital mic to broadcast, we wanted to put together a place where the community to discuss solutions. In other words, not you should do this as the city, but we can do this as a community. We wanted to set up a site that had multiple points of entry. We present the accountants and the CFOs with the raw numbers and the budget message from the city manager. We give the mayor a blog for timely news updates. And most importantly, we wanted to integrate new tools to have a conversation about the crisis. We obviously couldn't use anonymous comment boards. We didn't have the staffing or First Amendment leeway to set up heavily moderated forums. And we didn't have the technology for a digital town hall. So we called upon a local startup called User Voice. Using their deceptively simple software, citizens could suggest an idea directly to the city. Other users of the site could then vote those ideas up or down and comment on them in a structured way. Uh, user voice is structured so to really eliminate redundancy and reward practicality of suggestions. As the votes started tumbling in and the analytics told us that we were, were reaching further into the community than public meetings, town halls, or op-eds could normally get us, we were hearing the voice of the community emerge, and it was reasonable, it was creative, and it was helpful. Now, sorry for the eye chart, but this is an intelligent debate about taxation in the city. There's a CPA, a couple of Silicon Valley uh, executives, and even a physicist from UCSC discussing different revenue sources from different industries in town. And without a doubt, there were still outliers, but in our site, the outlier stayed an outlier. It took at least 60 people to agree with you to get on the main page of the website. Now, after a few days, the mayor started trolling through all of these responses and started compiling uh, responses to the ideas. Most of them were accepted, some were impossible, and some are under active debate at the city right now. The public helped expand the debate while also resetting our expectations inside the city of what was or wasn't possible in this crisis. Our analytics showed us that we were able to get about 8% of the community involved in the site. We fielded more than 200 suggestions, a couple of thousand individual votes, and more and we have feedback from our community on, for this issue, as well as ones that we'll face in the future. Now, despite the positive nature of this interaction, this budget crisis was still traumatic for my community. Another 46 positions, or 15% of the general fund, did have to be eliminated, and those that still work at the city, like myself, now are familiar with the term furlough Friday. So regardless of this hit, something about this site reinvigorated our community. In the end, our greatest success was getting more people involved in the conversation. No longer controlled by the outliers, the voice of the community united to face a continuing crisis. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. That was great. Our next talk is by Merrick Schaefer. He's with UNICEF in New York, New York, and his talk is called Texts for Africa, Can SMS Improve Children's Lives? Hello, everyone. My name is Merrick Schaefer, and uh, I work at UNICEF on an innovations team. Uh, we look at ways that changing technologies can, can uh, improve existing problems that UNICEF faces. Uh, before that, I was a web developer for 10 years, and now I have the much more difficult job of trying to manage other software developers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, UNICEF is not a uh, NGO or nonprofit. It's a UN agency. Uh, we work on all aspects of, of children's development from uh, health, uh, education, water and sanitation. We're also in 186 countries, giving us a truly global perspective. Uh, on our day to day, uh, uh, work is similar to a consultancy. We advise governments directly. Uh, we work with ministries. We do logistics work, uh, planes and trucks some days, uh, some days donkeys. Uh, due to our global nature, we uh, actually uh, function on economies of scale. We're one of the world's largest purchasers of vaccines, but we're also one of the world's largest purchasers of pencils. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you about a specific problem that my uh, innovation team was sent to solve, and uh, the project was based in uh, Malawi which is a uh, small uh, African country in East Africa. Uh, there you can see it. It's English speaking. It has uh, 14 million people in it. We worked with the Malawi Ministry of Health uh, to look at how they're recording uh, malnutrition data for children. Um, this project, like many others, was done in close partnership. Uh, we worked with six grad students from Columbia's International Relations Program, and we worked with the Malawi Ministry of Health, and we were trying to figure out how to use uh, technologies available in the country to improve their data collection. Um, 
With that in mind, uh, malnutrition is actually very, very easy to measure. It's very accurate. WHO, UNICEF, and others have come up with a, with a system that all you need is age, weight, height, and upper arm circumference, and you can get tremendously accurate readings, getting mild, mild cases as well as extreme cases. The process we initially modeled looked like this. A healthcare worker, not a nurse or a, or a doctor, there's very few of those, would actually write down uh, those indicators and mail them in on paper to, to the government. Uh, they didn't really understand why they were writing these things down, and they did not use them for diagnosis. On the government side, we went there. We we're very excited to build our databases, being software developers. We said, can we see your data? They said, sure. They put us in this room, and this is what we found, unopened envelopes. That was probably going to be used later for report writing or analysis, but it certainly was of no use to the government at that point, um, giving us lots of juicy problems to solve. Um, in Africa, there's a, there's a really uh, fast-changing technological landscape. Cell phones have exploded. 2 million 98 has turned into 500 million in 2010. 60% uh, of the people have access to uh, cell phones now. All of the health workers have it. We've built an open source framework called Rapid SMS to build uh, SMS applications. Um, and uh, we model processes in the country and we find ways that SMS can actually speed things up. And in this case, we're swapping paper for phones. You might say, SMS, what can you do with 160 characters? Well, all of those malnutrition indicators fit into a single text message. You pair that with powerful backend software, and you get a really powerful real-time information tool. Also, uh, costs are rather low in this program. All the health workers already had phones. There's no hardware procurement, no deployment of hardware. We had to train people, and we had to cover the cost of the SMS messages. And that was within the sort of constrained budgets we were working within. So when we went there uh, and we implemented the system in about six weeks, uh, healthcare workers then entered the, uh, the, the data directly by SMS into, into the system. The system uh, graphed it and mapped it real time, uh, allowing the government to have the data really be, be, be usable immediately. Additionally, this data was now on the cloud, so UNICEF and other humanitarian and development partners could take this data and use it as well, um, which uh, look at it at a country scope, a global scope, a regional scope, cross-compare regions. So it, was, it, was, it became very, very useful. Uh, additionally, the best insight we had in the whole project was one of our developers said, hey, why don't we send a thank you message to these community healthcare workers? They, they, they didn't even really fully understand why they had to record the data in the first place. Let's thank them for their work. Uh, and then we said, wait a second. We're already doing the math on the servers. Let's actually send a diagnosis. So the system now looked like this, um, with a message being sent back to the community healthcare workers with a diagnosis, empowering them to actually treat the children. So we went from a tool that was uh, for data collection to a tool that actually directly benefit the children's lives that we were collecting the data from. Uh, this project won the Net Squared 2.0 award from USAID and has been uh, adopted for a number of things, uh, from tracking food distribution during famine in Ethiopia, uh, malarial bed nets in Nigeria, and uh, in Senegal as an instigator for, for encouraging literacy. Uh, and uh, we have 23 projects the next year. Of course, the challenges uh, in innovation are not technology. You can't just throw phones and software at problems and solve them. It's all about institutional change. And UNICEF's big challenge of the next year is how can we take this real-time data and how can we use that to change how we work? Um, so thank you. That's the time I've got. You can learn more at our website, UNICEF Innovation, um, on rapidsms.org. You also can get all the source code uh, for our projects. It's up on GitHub, so if you have any coders out there, you can grab that and play with it. Uh, my Twitter and, and uh, email's up there. Come ask me questions. Thank you. And I'd like to um, welcome to the stage our next presentation, which is from the Utah Department of Public Safety about their media portal. Please welcome Jeff Nyberg. Hello, my name is uh, Sergeant Jeff Nyber with the Utah Department of Public Safety. I do have to say if I wish I did have a firearm, firearm on because I think I'd be less nervous. So with that, with that being said, um, earlier this year, the state of Utah released a new version of Utah.gov. The site features an all-inclusive social media portal focusing on open communication and accountability. It gives citizens a familiar way to communicate with government. In Utah.gov's Connect portal, there are centralized widgets, mobile applications, blog feeds, Twitter feeds, photos, multimedia, and RSS feeds, all of which were previously scattered throughout the Internet. In partnership with the state's efforts, the Utah Department of Public Safety has found several innovative ways to use social media, particularly Twitter, to communicate with citizens and the media. The Utah Department of Public Safety is responsible for 11 divisions serving such varied roles as Homeland Security, Fire Prevention, and statewide law enforcement. Our mission is to provide a safe and secure environment for all people in Utah. 
We communicate with citizens primarily through the media. The media reports on safety efforts and law enforcement incidents on a daily basis. Responding to the media in a timely and informative way is an important and serious challenge for us in Utah. That challenge intensifies when there's a high profile incident. In the past, I personally fielded hundreds of phone calls from media members repeatedly answering the same questions. This put us in a reactive mode and we were unable to communicate our desired message. To be consistent with our mission, we needed a solution to handle everyday media interactions in a more efficient manner. This need was the basis for our recently released public safety media portal. Through the media portal, I can communicate current public safety news and alerts directly to approved media outlets. The site allows me to post audio, video, photos, approved statements, and push RSS and SMS alerts via Twitter. It also happens to be the first of its kind and has recently won the Digital Government Achievement Award. The site also includes an active incident feed, which is a list of current calls to the dispatch center that the Utah Highway Patrol is responding to. It is updated every three minutes and includes the nature of the call, the location, and also the status. A top story section allows the media to quickly retrieve detailed information about high profile incidents. This area contains current and archived news releases. The media can access these releases for details, sound, pictures, and even video. Previously, delivering a dash cam video for local news required manual tape duplication and delivery to each station. Now with high profile incidents, we can include photos, audio, and video clips for immediate use through the top stories section. We also happen to use Twitter to display short alerts and updates from our office. The public can also follow these Twitter feeds, which has made it a valuable tool for reaching out to citizens directly. For those who have HTML5 compliant browsers and smart mobile devices, we deliver the most relevant incidents based on their location and display the incident in geographic context. Let's go ahead and take a look at how the site works and how, to, how information is delivered from incident to citizen. Dispatch receives a call, enters it into the system, and dispatches law enforcement. The call is automatically displayed in the active incident feed. I can then alert the media via Twitter. The media can take this information and send reporters out to the scene. Additionally, when a high profile incident occurs, I can log into the site and upload supporting information that the media can access and download for broadcast and publication. Finally, or actually from the initial 911 call to the nightly news, we now have an efficient flow of current information and a staff that can be responsive to our constituents. Rather than take my service pistol and inflict personal injury upon myself, call volume has actually been reduced by 40%. The pressures, the short deadlines, and the daily phone calls that I face have drastically been reduced and are handled in a more efficient manner. The online service is already being used by hundreds of users consisting of news directors, reporters, and interagency monitors representing all major media outlets in Utah to include television, radio, and newspaper. The site saves the media and my agency time and resources. It provides real-time information for reporters. It also utilizes a central location for information. It allows for direct communication to citizens through pushed alerts and much, much more. The media portal honestly simplifies communication and is convenient for everyone involved. The media is a critical partner in our ability to communicate with the public and allows us to advance our mission to better serve and protect the great state of Utah. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. That was very cool. Our next speaker is Rita J. King of Dancing Inc. Productions, also in New York, New York. And the title of her talk is Digital Diplomacy, Understanding Islam Through Virtual Worlds. Please welcome Rita to the stage. The subject matter is not that collection of solid, static objects extended in space but the life that is lived in the scene that it composes. And so reality is not that external scene, but the life that is lived in it. Reality is things as they are. The most advanced technology has always been used for war, but only a fraction of the budget and will are invested in government as a peacekeeping force. 
That's a mistake. This is not a cartoon. My collaborator Joshua S. Fouts and I spent a year traveling across four continents in the physical world and the virtual world of Second Life for our project, Understanding Islam Through Virtual Worlds. As the global economy and culture shift in the imagination age through technology and creativity, government has a real opportunity to become a peacekeeping force. This that you see here is the Johari window. Um, how you see yourself accurately, how you see yourself inaccurately, how others see you accurately, and how others see you inaccurately. This avatar in Second Life um, set fire to himself um, to show that he had sorrow and rage over escalating conflict in both sides of the Gaza conflict. Um, levels of interaction can be controlled through um, muting. I think the slides are moving more quickly than I'm used to them moving. Okay. <laughs> um, the, um, people can control how they interact in Second Life um, through banning speakers, muting speakers, and controlling the environment in different ways, um, as, you can, as you can see here. So, I'm, I'm not sure what, okay, this is ancient Mesopotamia, virtual ancient Mesopotamia. That's where our, our project started. The Federation of American Scientists uh, built this um, incredible space that um, shows what present day Iraq, um, it's present day Iraq where writing was invented. Um, and people of all faiths and uh, belief systems meet in Second Life and in virtual spaces. And also religion and spirituality are being explored in, in new ways. So. Government has a real opportunity here, um, and new questions are being raised. Uh, for example, is it um, disrespectful to wear um, virtual shoes in a, in a digital mosque? And in the absence of Arabic script, people are creating new ways to communicate with each other and um, to meet to discuss issues such as women's rights, education, war, terrorism, in ways that are far more candid than, than we're used to, to seeing. Uh, we took a virtual Hajj to Mecca uh, with people from all over the world. We had a guide from Egypt who we were able to interview about really important issues such as the evolution of the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt. And um, government is already exploring these spaces. Um, Paulo Kasaka, who's a European parliamentarian, um, went to Iraq and uh, broadcast his findings live from the elections to Second Life and to the internet as a whole. And I believe that the government should call on artists, journalists, and scientists capable of creating data visualizations and environments capable of sustaining and sparking new dialogue in, in a changing world and rapid metamorphosis. And so, thank you very much. Rita J. King on Twitter. Thank you, Rita. And up next, we have Melissa Jordan. She'll talk about Transit 2.0 at BART.gov. Please welcome Melissa. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Jordan, and I work for BART. That's Bay Area Rapid Transit. We're a special government district that provides heavy rail train service in the San Francisco area. And I'm one half of a two-person web team at BART. Why would we care about Web 2.0 at an agency that runs trains? Well, our customers are in transit by definition, and they're using the web to talk about their trips on BART, good, bad, and ugly, and they expect us to be there giving them web services, whether it's something as simple as checking a schedule or bringing them together to share experiences like the sights and the sounds and even the smells on our BART trains. So the challenge for us then is being, um, keeping that reputation for solid service, and that we can't be frivolous, we have to be authoritative. And the most important way that we do it is by being their first and best source of information. We saw this very vividly recently when we had a difficult labor negotiation that took us up to the brink of a strike. And um, we found customers returning to our social web channels because we could be very, very nimble and responsive there and get the word out quickly, but the official word, so people knew what was going on. The foundation for all of this is our main website, BART.gov. It's not your typical government website. Hot Studio of San Francisco helped us design it to put the rider needs first. It has real people. The lady uh, in the slide there is just a woman whose husband sent in her picture to us. We pull in images from Flickr to illustrate our station pages. We're also very proud of our open data policy with just two people. We don't have programmers in-house, but we share our data so third parties can build apps that our customers want, so we extend our reach that way. 
because we know no matter how great our website is, people won't always come to it. We have to go to them and give them the information when and how they want to get it. We also want to be part of the conversations happening online around our brand. And one way we do that is with the weekly feature called Seen and Heard on BART, where we collect anecdotes, um, the books you're reading on the train, the music you're listening to, what you're wearing. We feed it back to them, and it really does build a sense of community. Transit is very intimate and personal, and people like this. It helps us connect our customers with BART, and so we're not just a distant bureaucracy. We're just part of their everyday lives, sharing their ups and downs. And I know that sounds warm and fuzzy, but we're thinking about the ROI also. We're making a super, super small investment here. So any return, I think, is in the positive column. And there are a lot of good ways to measure. Our website traffic went up after we did this stuff. Um, also, our cost to serve a user with the web is very, very cheap compared to traditional call center. It doesn't pit us against the call center. But if we take the light touch, easy questions off their hands, they can help those people that really need it the most. And another measure is just the great feedback. These are opt-in channels, so customers are choosing to get our messaging. And that's really a valuable impression. I do want to acknowledge that it's hard in government. We can be slow, moving, risk-averse organizations, but there are some good reasons for that. Uh, we are the stewards of the public trust, and we have to operate carefully and only take intelligent risks. I have some crazy, bold, daring ideas. If I were gambling with VC money, maybe I could do it, but I'm watching over taxpayer money, so I can't always do that. Um, also, you have to kind of educate others in the organization and show them what's in it for them. We do it with the daily email update. It goes to anyone who wants it, and it gives them links to trending topics so they can hear what our customers are saying. Because the, as the early adopters, we do have to bring people along. They look to us to be their navigator on the web be the gatekeeper because there's a lot of weird stuff out there. Um, I get some terms sometimes like this one cupcaking that I would have to go look up to see what that means because I wouldn't know. So I go somewhere like Urban Dictionary, a uh, dictionary of slang. Well, I would go there, but in government it's blocked on my computer. <laughs> so I have to have a workaround and I got a backup computer off the network. It's really, really easy to do, but I have to insist on those kind of tools because it's my job to evaluate content and exercise judgment. There's a lot out there that's not suitable. Here's a picture of graffiti that someone sent in. It's a little cool and interesting, but I wouldn't use that because it might encourage illegal behavior, like tagging of trains. We don't want to do that. Similarly, some performance artists recently, I am in San Francisco, um, rigged up swings on the trains. These pictures went around the world. Um, they're on the front page of Dig, and they got hundreds of thousands of page views. So in the social space, it would have been really weird to say nothing about that, but what can you say? The police chief wanted to say, persons on swings are subject to removal, which just didn't seem right, even if it's true. So we use our blog. We have a blog with open commenting, and we got this more nuanced tone that said, yeah, you know, you can't do it. It's not safe. But we understand and we appreciate that spirit of whimsy and joy, simple pleasures behind what you did. So my last thought for you is I hope you can find a tone and a voice for your work that's genuinely inclusive and welcoming of your public because there's too much on the web already that is snarky and elitist, and I think government, especially government on the web, ought to be just the opposite. We should be bringing people in and serving them better. Thank you. So five great talks out of 25 great talks yesterday, out of 200 great submissions that we received. And we're trying to find a way to make many of those submissions that didn't become talks uh, something that the public can access through the O'Reilly website, through the gov2expo.com website, um, so that this can form the basis of discussion and comment and try to build a community of people that are interested in these topics as we work towards Government 2.0 Expo uh, in Washington, D.C. in May 2010. Thank you very much.